So the focus of our call this afternoon is going to be uh, booking again. Uh, so it'll be a uh, check-in on uh, progress we've been making since our last uh, call, um, and then start to, we're going to do a quick high-level run-through of um, some documentation that Nick and I have been um, putting together. Um, I'm just looking at who's on the call. I don't, I don't recognize Siv and Sam. Um, apologies if you have been on the call and I've missed you before, but did you want to just do a quick intro to say where you're from? Um, sorry, it's Siv and Luke. Uh, we're developers that I'm in. Ah, okay, fine. <laughs> right, I, just, I didn't recognize the names. There we go. Yeah, sorry, I'm fairly new and I haven't been on one of these calls before. Okay. All right. Um, so let me just share my screen. Okay, uh, so hopefully you can see the slides I've put together for today's call. Um, just make those a bit bigger. Okay. Right, so the agenda today is to just uh, do a quick recap on what we proposed to make some progress on last time. So you can see um, which bits we've, um, we've moved forward with and which bits are still to do. Um, and then, as I say, we wanted to look through the, um, the two documents that Nick and I have been working on. So I'm going to uh, briefly take you through the use cases and requirements doc that I circulated to the mailing list yesterday. Uh, and Nick is going to do a, a quick walkthrough of a um, draft design document that he's been working on um, just to start to uh, pull together some ideas about what, what the actual API design um, could be. Um, if anyone has any other um, things that topics that they want to discuss, then um, uh, ch either chat out now or um, at the end of the call, so we can we can cover those. And then, as usual, I'll just recap what uh, what I'm expecting to cover over the next few weeks. Uh, so, has anything anybody got anything that they particularly want to talk about today that's not on that list? No. Nope. Okay. All right. If you think of it at the end, I'll check in again. Right. Um, so just a quick review of our um, planned uh, roadmap. So last time uh, we reviewed the, um, uh, the outcome of the workshop um, and our broad high level plan for what we want to do um, to support uh, making more opportunity data bookable. Um, so we're planning to publish a set of uh, best practices around API design. We want to support and encourage people who are um, already publishing uh, booking APIs or are currently working on them to uh, converge on those best practices um, so that we can get more consistency across the sector. And in parallel, also working on developing a recommended design for a booking API uh, and trying to get this adopted across the sector because we know that uh, there's a whole bunch of people who are uh, uh, waiting for that kind of guidance to um, help inform their plans. So that's the kind of broad framework that we're going to be working on and within uh, over the next, uh, the next few months. Um, so in terms of the actual tasks, the short term tasks that we identified at, at the workshop and in subsequent discussions, um, there's a few, I just wanted to quickly go through those and show which ones we've made progress on. So I've circulated the workshop summary. We discussed that last time uh, at the workshop. Um, attendees said that it'd be good to have a set of use cases and requirements that would inform the design. So we've done some work to put that together, um, which is a document that I circulated yesterday and we'll go through in a moment. Um, we also need to, to have a discussion around uh, minimum user data. Now we've got some, I've ticked that off, um, but just because we've got some proposals that are in some of the draft designs, um, uh, we probably need to have a further discussion around that. Um, but I think we, we know what the minimum is in terms of um, uh, what's required to actually service a booking, um, but other people have got different definitions of minimum depending on um, their needs for uh, you know, support participants, get funding, etc. So there is still some discussion to be had there. Um, we also said that we needed to start to identify some early pilot implementations. Um, we know we've, um, I think we're engaging, and Nick's in touch with a, a number of people who are currently working on um, building out booking APIs and are trying to work within the guidance and best practices that, um, that we're putting together here. So I think we can tick that off. Um, and in um, 
probably in about a month's time, uh, we'll do a kind of check-in uh, to see how people have fared with um, those early experiments. Um, haven't yet published the uh, API design best practice. Um, I, there is going to be a link in the document that I will share today. Um, so rather than, um, it, it just needs some a further review revisions, but rather than sit on it, um, I thought I'd just actually just publish it out and you, you can all contribute if you've got um, questions or feedback on it. Uh, so I just kind of tick that off today as well. Um, uh, obviously, we need to start drafting the API spec itself. Um, <clears throat> so that's the piece of work that Nick has started on. Um, as we discussed last time, we're doing that within a Google document um, that I think has been shared with a few people initially, but um, we're going to uh, circulate wider today. Um, we're going to use the Google document to make it easier to kind of collaborate around the texts um, and have discussions on, on particular features before turning it into a more formal doc. Um, things that we haven't done yet, um, we haven't started to look at what's the minimum set of opportunity data fields that we need for an event or facility in order to ensure they're bookable. Um, that's something I want to look at in our next call. Uh, and then we need to do a bit of work just to make sure that everyone outside this group has got a clearer view on uh, what the roadmap is and start to engage more with the community. So there'll be, um, I think, some blog posts and some comms from uh, the Open Active uh, initiative as a whole, uh, just to um, to take off that piece over the coming weeks. Uh, so that's where we are. Um, I'll circulate the slides after the call. So we've got basically got four working docs at the moment. There's the workshop write-up which I've shared. There's the use cases and requirements which I shared yesterday, um, and then uh, two docs that uh, you will hope have seen yet, but we can start to dig into are the API best practices and the uh, the booking specification that Nick's going to take us through. So I'm, I'm going to kind of just, we'll do a regular check-in uh, over the coming months uh, around these documents, just so everyone is clear on what the status is and where to go to provide feedback and input um, so that uh, we can kind of focus everyone's attention in a useful way. Um, so that's where we are so far, um, you know, in terms of broader updates. So I wanted to have a uh, walk through of the use cases and requirements. Um, hopefully some of you have already had a chance to look at it. Uh, I've already had comments from a few people already. Um, I, there shouldn't be anything surprising in there for anyone because I, I've hopefully captured everything that we discussed in the, in the workshop. Um, but uh, this would be a good opportunity just to see if we've missed anything. So um, the, I'll show the document in a minute, but just kind of just give you some context of why I've put it together and how I've put it together. Um, wanted some high level use. <coughs> let me start again. The reason for putting this together is to make sure that everyone is clear on the scope for the first uh, pieces of work we're doing around booking. Um, so we want to make sure that we are acknowledging all of the requirements um, that have come from uh, everyone who's has provided uh, uh, feedback and suggestions so far, um, but also just clarify how we're planning to uh, prioritize working on, on those requirements. So the use cases should hopefully capture um, the, the various uh, needs for different types of uh, users that, that we've engaged with. So um, uh, the the platforms, people providing the access to the APIs, the third party applications that are using them, um, and uh, end users. Um, we haven't actually engaged with the end users, but I've kind of couched some of these requirements in, in terms of their needs of what, what they want to achieve by booking a uh, place on an event or booking to use a facility. Uh, as I say, all of these are, should be based on our existing discussions. Um, and what I've done is I've tried to capture everything. So it's trying to be comprehensive, at least as, as far as the input that we've had so far, but just acknowledging that not all of them are going to be in scope for version one. Um, again, the reason for doing that is just to make sure that um, when we have, uh, you know, when we start to share with the wider community, everyone's clear that we have acknowledged that, that there are the specific needs or extra requirements. It's not that we're ignoring them. It's just that we've, we've, we've chosen to uh, explore those at a later date. Um, and by having documented them, it means that we can come back to them later and, uh, and start to work out how they fit into to the, the plans and into, into the detailed technical designs. So the use cases are kind of catch at a high level, you know, complete a booking as a guest user, determine if there are still spaces available for events, etc. Um, we'll, we'll look at some more examples in a moment. 
then for each of those use cases, I've tried to decompose those into some um, a more finer grain technical requirements. Um, and they're intended to be a checklist that we can use to help um, review the design of the API to make sure that we are addressing uh, the needs of all of those use cases through what, what we're building. Um, some of them are um, non-functional requirements, um, you know, just touch on things like security, but also things like um, availability of, of test harnesses and test implementations, which uh, kind of set, sit outside the API design and more about how um, developers are supported in um, starting to use APIs exposed from a, a specific platform. Um, so that's kind of my overview. Let me just kind of uh, show the document. Uh, I can see a few people are in it already. Um, uh, hopefully you can still see this, all right? Um, so the, um, what I've started to do at the start of this document um, is uh, spell out some terminology. Um, that was something that was highlighted quite quickly in the workshop that we needed to be clear about um, the different um, roles involved in servicing third party booking. So, um, you know, what, what's the role of the platform? What is the third party? Differences between users, account holders, members, etc. So there's just a bit of definitions here. Um, some of the things that um, some of the terms are already defined in the model and spec, um, but there are a few others that we also need to define for this specific workflow. Um, so if you have any feedback on the, those kind of definitions, uh, Nick's provided some input already, then um, that, that would be very helpful uh, to make sure that, that, like, we spent a lot of time when we were doing the modeling spec trying to get this terminology work right, and I think that helped to make sure that everyone uh, was more confident about the design we ended up with. So uh, I also want to make sure that we've got these uh, definitions um, uh, right and they're acceptable for everyone before we kind of um, make too much more progress elsewhere. Um, so the, the use cases, um, they're divided up into use cases for um, users, platforms, and third parties. So the third party is, is the term I've given to the application that is the client of the API. Um, the um, most of the requirement, most of the use cases rather, are under the users rather than the other the stakeholders. So that would be something um, that I could draw your attention to. Uh, as, so are there additional use cases um, from a platform point of view or from a third party point of view that aren't covered by some of the existing requirements? Um, so please, you know, please take a look there and, and give us some feedback on the document. Um, so just give you a, a sense of the kind of the, the detail that are in there. Um, it's supposed to be quite, uh, quite straightforward. Um, so first one, see the price to participate in an event or facility. Right? So it's just reflecting the fact that we need to be able to show um, it, within the opportunity data, there needs to be a price, uh, clear price available um, that can be used by third party application to filter discovery based on price. You know, somebody might just be interested in free events. Uh, or be able to actually uh, properly initiate the, the booking workflow. For each of the use cases, I've uh, highlighted where, how they decompose into some of the more fine-grained requirements, so you can click through the later in the document. So there's some cross-referencing there to make sure that we've got um, uh, a kind of clear audit trail that we can, you know, for every, every requirement that we've got in the spec, we can go back to uh, like where it came from. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail because it's probably better for, easier for you to kind of review um, uh, at your leisure. Um, but just to kind of highlight a few things, like there are uh, some use cases on here uh, about authenticating as an existing account holder on a platform, um, which I, I think we'd, we'd agreed were, would be um, out of scope for version one. Um, but I have included them here and tried to indicate how they break down into additional requirements. Um, so it just help us move on to that kind of uh, later stage of the, of the, the API development because um, we've got this kind of groundwork in place. Um, so take a look, uh, take a look through these. Um, so give me feedback on the, um, the scope 
the wording. Um, tell me if there's things that are missing. Um, a few things that occurred to me that I, I think we might need to have um, a bit more discussion around is um, around the handling of uh, personal data. Um, so obviously we need to be mindful that what we're defining here um, conforms to um, uh, GDPR, um, that we're doing all of the right things in terms of handling personal information, um, but importantly, uh, that third party applications can do the right thing in terms of making it clear about where somebody's personal data is going to end up. So if you're submitting uh, your you know, name and contact in information through an app, what platform is going to be storing that? Um, because if they later need to want to, they later want to exercise some of their rights under GDPR, so ask for the data to be removed, they need to know where to go. Um, I don't think we've quite nailed down yet whether we we're expecting um, third parties to, to remain kind of in the loop there or whether users are going to be uh, directed back to the platform. Um, but so there's, there's some things to discuss, I think, as part of the design there. But I've tried to draw out these, these kind of use cases. Um, I think there's, so, for example, if um, so within a uh, booking workflow, uh, users work may need to be presented with terms and conditions. Uh, they may need to be uh, asked to give consent for their data to be stored or used in certain ways. Um, if that's the case, then um, that information will need to be exposed in a machine readable way uh, for uh, a third party to be able to um, show the right terms and conditions, the right consent um, check checklists uh, for, for the specific platform that is accepting the booking. So that is that kind of detail that we will need to get into. Um, and I think uh, when we come back to discussing the um, minimum user information, uh, we need to bear GDPR in mind as well there. Um, uh, I, there's a key point uh, in GDPR that um, you, know, you can't withhold consent uh, or collect information you, you don't need. Um, so, uh, we'll have to just kind of factor that in and that might it, it require us to um, document specific kinds of confirmation workflows um, uh, or interactions with the users. Um, so that's the use cases. Um, if I just skip forward to the requirements. Um, so I've uh, created a big table of the, the various requirements that I've drawn out of the use cases. Um, try to give them all a kind of ID to make it easier for us to track them. Um, there's a column in this table on the right hand side which indicates whether I think it's in scope for version one of the spec. Um, most of them are. The things that, um, that we've already highlighted that aren't are um, creating accounts, um, gener creating accounts, authenticating to existing accounts, um, and other more sophisticated uh, workflows like um, uh, booking uh, multiple events, so kind of uh, more sophisticated kind of shopping cart type things or uh, more complex pricing scenarios where you might need to uh, display some of your price based on whether they are a member or not of, of some service. Um, so hopefully that will help uh, helps kind of reinforce what, what is in scope uh, initially. Uh, so for each of those, there's just a, a brief summary of what the, what the requirement is. Um, I've cross-linked to the existing spec where um, we might have already covered some of these requirements or um, uh, terminology that, that applies. Um, so just to give an example, um, we obviously need to be able to uniquely identify um, the events and facilities that are going to be used in the booking. Um, we can already do that within the modeling spec, um, but people aren't necessarily applying that part of the spec in a consistent way. So that's where we need to go back and revise either the specification or provide a bit more guidance to publishers about what's the minimum data that's required to make their data bookable. Um, the same is true for uh, pricing and uh, availability uh, to make sure that people do it in a consistent way, um, making sure that offers are being attached to um, events. Um, Nick has already highlighted a, a specific thing in there around how uh, people are publishing data around um, free events where we might need to um, make some stronger recommendations in the spec. 
Um, but, but that's in line with what we were expecting to do anyway, because the first version was really just to help people publish what they have. Um, and then we can kind of raise the bar at a later date. Um, so again, I'll let you kind of look through the, the requirements, um, but I would hope that we can do a, as we work on the, uh, the API design, we can use this as a, um, as a checklist to make sure that we've covered everything off. Um, and then we're not also not doing things that are outside the scope for, for version one. Um, so that's, that's what I just wanted to quickly go through in terms of the use cases and requirements. Um, has anyone got any um, uh, comments or feedback on the document so far? Any thoughts to share? I'm still working my way through the document, so um, I'm sure that I will have have some feedback to it. I just haven't had a chance to go through the whole thing yet. So. Okay, great, thanks. Jamie, do you just see you about to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say it looks really good. Um, I would perhaps um, uh, make it clear what would be the initial phase one use cases. Um, and just split it out a bit there. But other than that, looks really good. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll see, perhaps I'll see if I can kind of surface some of that um, more visibly in the in the text. Um, I, I did put, but yeah, okay. Because so, te you don't get to that until later in the document, so I can, I can probably find a way to make that more, I was just gonna, more accessible. I was just going to reflect um, what we said earlier that um, I haven't finished going through it. In fact, I haven't started going through it. Um, I will do. Okay, great, thank you. Um, any other comments from anyone? It, it's, it's fine if you haven't had a chance to look for it, I only circulated it yesterday, it's, it's a 10 page document. I, I was gonna bring this up with the group actually, if, if that, I, it was my first comment that you kind of showed there at the top, but I wonder whether we should, um, just the word third party, um, got, got a, a few, I had a few conversations in the last couple of weeks about where that, that is an ambiguous term. Um, and um, I'd suggested in here that we, we might consider using broker to um, indicate where the, the, bro the, the third party is a kind of third party in the true sense of another organization other than the provider who might be making the booking um, as a broker rather than a third party. Because I think that there was a, the third, third party is going to be considered as apps that the leisure operator already uh, um, has a commercial relationship with, but on behalf of leisure operators. So um, GLL's own app would be a third party but then so would change for life um and i think that, that particularly came out of the conversation with legends because i know that there were there were two quite different use cases in some of the things we were talking about depending if you're an app or a, a, a change for life thing so i wonder whether we call them i wonder whether we call the latter one a broker um using schema.org's kind of terminology for that um and then and then have another name for the uh the app kind of scenario the uh, people who are the seller, as it were, side. How specific is this to the, the brokering environment, the IMS? And how, how general is it meant to be to cope with the apps and your personal web service services? Um, it, well, it should be, it, it's not been designed with I'm, I'm in, in mind. It, it should just be a, um, a, a general purpose API. I, I was actually gonna suggest um, in, instead of broker, because like, I hadn't realised that there was this, the term was overloaded, whether we should just use client, that, that's effectively what we're talking about, and we don't have to identify what type of client. The term we use internally is external service. So in my stories, as an external service, I want to XYZ. Um, just a suggestion. It's, it seems to cover, it's neutral enough to cover all the bases, and it's squeezing the active. So, so, so uh, Ian, one of the stories um, I'm, I'm interested in how you've described it um, is the one where we talked about, um, do you remember there was that thing about new, um, I, th I think we called them third, I just want to use the words again, third party um, users or third party accounts or something. Um, is it, did you use the words third party to talk about those? And then I guess that is there a distinction between a third party account and a, a, a whatever we're calling the other type of account? Um, I don't remember. That's the honest answer. Um, external service is how we refer to all consumers of the API in Legend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I think that we've used the word third party aggregator. That's probably what I was talking about, where it's an IMIM type thing. So where there is not a direct commercial relationship with the operator. I mean, there is obviously, but with many operators. So uh, if you've got the GL with an app, that's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. Mm. If you've got I'm in with 400 different leisure operators, you wish, um, then that's a different thing again. So that's probably where I might have used third party, but if I'm perfectly honest, I can't remember. That's okay. No, no, no. I think that's that's good. I, I like external service. Um, so the, the the particular functional distinction there from the the last conversation was that if uh, an app that GLL owns, which is an external service, creates an account, that would be one type of account. But if a, an app that if a, if an I'm in or something uh, creates an account, that would be a, another type of account. That's right. Yes. The idea there being that you 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 don't have to try and um, link up to a DLL account, which gives you 100% discount. Um, if you're uh, in IMN, for example, you just get whatever the price of the day is rather than getting special discount. Uh, I don't think we're at the moment ready to work at how to link up external and internal accounts. It's certainly something we've found quite challenging. Yeah, and so that, so I suppose the terminology question there is just what are we calling those two different, what sound like distinct things, uh, external and in external and internal accounts for an external service to use something like yeah well okay. do, do we do we need to distinguish because how how the platform chooses to you know create the accounts or store the user information is outside the scope of the of the api design um if we really would just need to identify what are the general requirements of a client no matter what kind of organizational relationship there is between them and the platform I, I think that the requirement here is that if the um, at the external service um, identifies itself as a aggregator, then the um, the the platform will do something. And if it identifies itself as an app owned by the letter operator, then it will do something else. So there's a there's a functional distinction in what happens depending on how it identifies itself. But is that is that uh whatever that behavior might be are we saying that that is something that is true of all platforms and all of those types of clients that everyone has to do it the same way because if they don't then it shouldn't be within the api spec it should just be a part of uh, the detail of that platform implementation or part of the integration process of sort of best practice thing actually it may not be best practice but you know, we we wrangled for two or three hours before coming up with that um, and i think we were quite fortunate someone had that idea so i think it's useful um, for the leisure operators to have some guidance as to how they might work with um, a third party aggregator. It, no, it shouldn't be part of the API spec. I don't think it should be, but I think it's, a rel it's related information that should be accessible to people like us. So we don't have to think too much. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, fair enough. I, well, I, I've noted down in the comment that the things that, that just come up there and um, I, I can make some changes. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments on the use cases doc at this stage, or if not, we'll, we'll move on to the next piece. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. So um, what I was going to move on ne to next was the um, looking at the work that Nick has been doing around uh, a draft design for the API. Uh, so as, as I was saying earlier, um, there's a number of projects that are kind of in flight at the moment. Um, it seemed a good opportunity to try and um, start to point people in a common direction. Um, so that's why Nick has kind of um, started to do this drafting work. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to get some real implementation feedback from some of these um, early design decisions. Uh, so Nick, do you, how do you want to go through this? Um, we start with the work yeah, I can. I'll talk to that, and then I'll share my screen for the the doc. Um, first of all, I've got to say that um, thank you so much for everybody who's kind of contributed to this directly and indirectly. Um, the um, so specifically the guys that I'm in that did the first draft to kind of kick us off, and um, also Make Sweat who did a significant amount of um, of work on their API that influenced the design. Um, so those two, and in, in, in particular, but also thanks for Axel for your 
uh, input and also for Ian for your uh, for the workshop because that stuff's also fed in in terms of the way that we've been talking about things and thinking about things in uh, in Legend and your API design there. So um, they're the uh, particular people. Um, oh, and Jamie for your for the um, API you provided a while ago. There's a um, you, you gave us a spec a few months ago that was useful. So thanks everybody. Um, hopefully I've tried to do it justice bringing this into one um, because everyone's kind of come come at it from slightly different angles. Um, the main thing we've tried to do for the first version is just create an MVP that's really succinct and does something simple that we can kind of start to implement. Um, because I know that there's uh, some some folks are, are already at a, a bit of an urgent need to um, to implement some um, some of this design now for their various reasons. Um, so that's um, so I know that for example, Make Sweat. I know Nick's not here, but I know he's already implemented quite a bit of this, um, and um, I'm aware that. Uh, Axel has also done a little bit of work too, uh, although he's just disappeared as I mentioned him. There we go. Anyway, um, so uh, so that's what's um, that's what this is. Um, the three bits that this does, the three parts of this spec, and which I'll I'll just open up in a second, are the three that's listed on this slide. Um, so the first thing is it's, it's a, a mechanism to get the latest availability and, and pricing information um, for a particular event. It went through some iteration, but we're, I think we're at something quite simple now, which is effectively an endpoint that gets a single event where otherwise it would have come from the feed. Um, so that's that one. And then there's this uh, two-step, two-phase commit. There's a lease and a book step. Um, the lease is, um, at the moment, it's an order, um, somewhat modeled off the uh, basket that, that Legend has. Um, and uh, the idea with that is that you can create an order, you can add items to the order. And then when you uh, want to book the, when you want to complete the booking, you just add a payment to the order and that completes it. Um, and that um, uses the schema.org order semantics and things that are built into that. So we're, we're basing all of the language currently is coming straight from schema.org. We haven't, I think we've only used one additional, um, which I'll, I'll come to talk about, um, element that isn't in schema um, because they've, they've got quite an advanced model for both invoices and for the order. Um, so that's what that is. Um, before I switch the screen over, does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything about that? Nick, uh, you've got a lease struck, is accessible for free booking, uh, as if they were alternatives. But in fact, even ah. if it's free, you still want to be able to lease it until you come to the commit stage. Uh, that is a good point. Um, Let's, let's talk about that, actually. I'll switch over and, and let's make that the first uh, thing to talk about. Um, that's a really good point. Uh, because commitment is a useful thing to do. Uh, if I press this button with any luck. Well, we can't do commitment. Everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ian, uh, your volume seems to be phasing in and out, and you're very quiet at the moment. Um, is there any way you could move your mic closer to where you are? Uh, how's that going? Uh, still the same. Then I'm afraid I'm going to leave it uh, in the hands of technology. Oh, no, that. I've done nothing. Oh, really? Okay. Fair enough. I blame the internet. <laughs> Have you seen? Can you see this now? Have you got that? Yes. Excellent. Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is the. Um, this is the booking spec, and this will be shared after this, I believe, if you haven't already seen it. Um, so it does at the beginning, the topic references the use cases document that Lee's just gone through, uh, summarizes the goals uh, that come, come out of that document, and also the non goals, things that aren't in scope for it. Um, but rather than go into the detail of this now, I thought it might be good to just talk to some particular points, which, such as the one Ian just highlighted um, in the document. So um, I'd, I have used the broker phrasing um, preempting conversation here, so we'll change that depending on the outcome of our whatever the terminology is. Um, also use the uh, RFC errors spec, so that all the errors conform to that, um, which is quite straightforward. Um, and then this uh, this get latest event data, which is the bit I just, just mentioned at the, the, the first bit um, about. It's just as simple as um, getting the session with the session ID here, and that returning just a single event object as one would get from the feed um, but just with everything in it. 
and so this allows me to just just talk about the thing that Ian's re mentioned there, which is a really good point. So there's two ways when you return an object at the moment. There's two ways it can come back. One is that it comes back with an offer. And if it's got an offer, it's got a price, a currency, and you can actually book the offer. Um, and that, that offer is obviously an offer on an event. So in this case, it's Speedball, Speedball on the 27th of the 1st at 11 a.m. Um, and it costs £39. Pounds. Um, and that's, that's one mode for a paid session. Another mode is a free session. And a free session, according to schema, doesn't actually need an offer at all. It just needs the is accessible for free um, property to be set to true. Um, and the issue with this is that if you have a free thing like this, that, that then um, you don't actually need to pay it because obviously you can just but you can just confirm it instantly um but ian your point is absolutely right and i, I hadn't actually thought about it until just now that you probably still do want to have the concept of reserving it and then confirming it as two-step process uh yes uh, i mean if it's just a one-off booking if you're only going to say I want to squash court at three o'clock and it's free, which seems unlikely. Um, then you can just, you don't need a basket, technically speaking. You can have an operation that's uh, create basket lease complete. Yeah. Mm. Um, but I would have thought, what? but you, know, you, you may still be putting, you may still want to put many free things in a basket. So you've got yourself, you've got your daughter, you've got your maiden aunt, and you all want to go to this free session. But of course, by the time you get to the end, you know, you, you might have no capacity free. So you, I think you still need that lease and commit or unlease process. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> so uh, Nick and I uh, very briefly discussed this, but I, I think this is one area where I think it, it'd, it'd be fine for us to um, put some extra requirements around the data model. So while um, schema.org has this property for indicating free events, for consistency it might be easier if we just say uh, every every uh, event should have an offer even if it's zero cost um, because it just gives some consistency to the data um, and then um, I'm sure Nick's going to go into this but then it provides a kind of consistent way to hook into the the booking workflow yeah that, I think that, 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 that's right. I think I think that sounds like the consensus that we're kind of coming to here. Um, there's a there's a comment on the side of one of these that talks about something similar, um, and uh, I think I think that's I think basically uh, yes. So this is um, I think this is Nick and, and potentially Axel already comments on this as well um, with something similar. So maybe maybe the simplest thing to do here is rather than using the semantics of is it accessible for free, we have a zero price offer, um, which is which is effectively um, an offer here with a price of zero, no currency, um, and that offer is then you can you can complete that and and pay it in inverted commas, but it's obviously zero. So your confirmation isn't actually a transaction, um, but at least it's then consistent. So you don't you you complete the payment in the same way as you would for a paid booking. It's just with a zero cost at the end, and and no invoice generated. Uh, I'm, one thing I'm noticing here is there seems to be a certain amount of redundancy. Um, this is a detail record, and to get it back, you've got to know what the record is. But then you're um, you're including things like the organizer uh, and prob well, the ID kind of makes sense in it. Um, two things: you've got a session ID and a bookable item ID. I'm not quite sure why they're different. And secondly, do you need to have that redundancy in there, or the use cases where you might be passing? this object around without it being linked to the original um, listing request. Oh, the offer being passed around on its own, you mean? I mean, that whole object there, if you go right up the top, yeah? Yeah. So we've got um, an identifier. You've got identifiers, you've got, so it's called by a session ID. You've got an identifier, which is one thing. You've got an identifier, which is 9209. Uh, and you've also got a, a bookable item ID. I, I guess that's, may reflect on the price so you might have different prices for some circumstance we don't quite understand but um do you need all of those different things in there or in fact are they redundant 
that's so that's a good that's a good segue onto the next question about this bookable item id because you're absolutely right that is a that is a contentious uh point as well so um i'll jump down to this so we're just uh covering these in the kind of in an interesting order but that's okay so um we um i'm just kind of looking at time so let's if we spend the kind of five minutes on each of these kind of remaining questions that might be probably most helpful so um uh, so the fight, so the the bookable item ID here. Uh, the issue with that was that if we have uh, if we have it in, is accessible for free option, then you have to put a bookable item ID in the pet, in the object which is an event in order for it to be consistent. Uh, so you can add it to a basket later, or add it to a whatever we're calling it an order, um, because the event type is different to the offer type. Um, However, what we've just discussed just now is, is unifying it so there's always an offer. And if there's always an offer, then there's always going to be an offer ID, in which case this doesn't need to be there and we can just instead have the ID of the offer, um, which is then sufficient to describe anything that you book. Does that it make sense to simplify it? Do you have use cases where you'd have many different offers for one booking? Yeah, so uh, examples would be um, you've got a, an adult junior. Uh, concession price um, or a, a day pass uh, or a, a week pass. Okay. Okay, so I, I mean, I'll, I think I think we probably, I mean, that's, I know it's a, mainly Ian talking, but um, I'm judging from the comments and from what Lee said as well, uh, are we, I think we're probably kind of agreed that using offers consistently and using the ID so as not to as you say, overloaded this uh, too much is probably what we want. Yeah, agreed. Okay, excellent. Great. Motion carried. Right, next. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the next point of, uh, of interest to talk about here is just this uh, idea. There are two ways, and I've just, just created some issues with some... Uh, uh, so this this issue here, issue two. There are two ways of doing a shopping basket. Now, one is is the way that, that Legend have currently implemented it, um, and the other is a way that I've heard discussed and um, and talked about in, in some of the, from some other folks on the call. Um, and the two diff the difference between the two uh, approaches is is this. So, in the uh, shopping basket approach, you create an order, a persistent thing, and you add items to the order. And at the point of completion at checkout, you then add a payment to the order and that order is complete and that order is then persisted. Um, should a, uh, a timeout occur, so say some, you know, the user disappears for some reason, then the order is, is um, uh, disappears, vanishes if it hasn't been paid. And that's how you kind of, it's effectively a lease, uh, an order which has not been paid is effectively a lease in that case. Um, the other alternative is that instead of having a single persistent order object that gets filled up with stuff, we don't have a single object. We actually just individually lease all the different things. So let's say we were booking three different classes. We would acquire three different leases. And then at the point of payment, we would pass in the three lease IDs into the payment um, call, however we do that, add them to the order uh, and complete the payment. And, and the way that that would work then is that the leases are all independent. And then at the point of payment, you, you're collecting them together and saying, this is my transaction. I wanna book these things. Um, now, the advantage of the shopping basket is that the, uh, the, there's one thing to time out. So as you add things to that basket, obviously, if the, every time you add something, it's resetting the timeout, which means that you, you can, you know, if, if there's a five minute elapsed period where the basket will disappear or 15 minutes or whatever it is, that that will be, um, that will be affecting all the items in the basket, not just the most recent one. Or conversely, on the uh, collection mm -hmm. of leases, you'll obviously have to make sure you keep refreshing each lease every time the user does something to ensure that they don't time out by the time the user gets to the end of the journey. Um, and so, um, but obviously the shopping basket requires persisting with that basket um, versus the leases, which don't require some kind of centralized persistence. You can just, um, but you still need to persist the leases, of course, because they're effectively stopping other people from booking. So I, I don't know if anyone had any thoughts on, on that. Uh, Nick, so uh, in the use cases and requirements doc, uh, it says the uh, book multiple events use case is uh, not being considered for version one. 
Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I should have said that. Yes, yeah, so the reason, and the reason to ask this question now at this point is because um, if we have a broad consensus on this, then it helps us to design the basic version one, which obviously doesn't include, I mean, effectively, you could have a one item shopping basket or a lease, and it's just subtle difference in terms of how we present those and the semantics around them. At this point, obviously, the implementation would be more complex if we allow the shopping basket to have more than one item or allow uh, you to pay more than one lease. Yeah, so I see what you're saying. Uh, I suppose the, the question is, would it be difficult to do a migration uh, from version one to version two or whatever, uh, either way? Because if, it, if, if, it, if the difficulty of moving from either of those to, uh, from say a single lease to a shopping basket is, if, if that's not gonna be difficult, uh, if that's just in terms of like uh, the format of the JSON structures that are passed around, then um, maybe it doesn't, uh, matter so much to decide it yeah yeah we could just pick one i mean it probably needs we probably need to fall on one side or the other and happy to at the moment it I, there's, there is a default that's in the spec so but i just wanted to kind of throw it out just before we did that just in case anyone had a because of course whichever we choose at this point we can change in the next version as is the case for a lot of this um just didn't, didn't want to put a default in without having at least thrown it out to the floor I think, so Nick Bailey here from Makesworth, I'm not sure anyone heard me earlier, I think I had muted myself. Um, in terms of the complexity of building it, it's much simpler if we, if we just have individual leases. Um, and then it's up to the broker sites. Um, I didn't hear that conversation, but you may have called it something else, but, but the broker site essentially has, if it wants to do, if it wants to keep track of leases, it does that at the broker site level. Um, you, you're not trying to create an extra kind of type of entity relationship between the broker and the actual booking platform yeah i'm not sure i see a whole lot of difference in complexity implementation to be honest um because whatever you, whatever you do you've got to collect a, a list of leases against uh, a, a an account and you've got to lease the leases and you've got to commit the leases or release them so i i'm struggling to understand what the difference in complexity is The individual leases doesn't require the booking site to have an entity to contain the leases because each they're each just a separate a separate lease. It as in the relationship is held by the broker, not by the management platform. So well, if you push the responsibility down to the management platform, you need you need to start talking about adding um, and you need to start talking about adding a, a reservation to um, a collection of reservations. It, it just feels more complex. Uh, okay. So I, that's my opinion. I mean, you know, see it. Okay. It's not, my opinion is not. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I see that. Um, Can I ask uh, if there's any uh, impact on payment between the two? Um, if you're paying for multiple different leases uh, using the same payment token, for example? I suppose the main difference is with the um, order on the on the right hand side with the shopping basket that when you've got the payment you're assigning it to the basket itself which has got all of the items in it already um, whereas you're constructing that basket effectively at the point of payment with the lease option on the left so um, I think you probably end up with the same outcome when you actually construct the lease um, and sorry construct the, the, the payment um, I, I, I actually, I, I actually wonder whether it's it's actually easier to implement the basket option of the two because um, if you've only got one item to persist, and then you're effectively adding a payment to that item, um, that that's probably easier than persisting lots of leases and then collecting them together at the end, which has got two uh, bits. But sorry, that Jamie, that wasn't. Yeah. Cool. Well, also in the the payment, if um, uh, the uh, the platform were to check that payment, then uh, if it's a collection of leases, that payment wouldn't match up. Whereas if it's, it's shopping basket, it might. Uh, yes, you're right. So in both cases, we'd have to make sure that the payment itself was a, a well, the invoice or whatever we call it, would 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 be a collection of those things uh, and persisted, so that you know that that was the same payment made. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the design changes the the end point of the. Of the workflow it's just it's just really what where the state 
or where some of the state is being held in the middle. Uh, and with the collection of leases, the client is holding the state, the connection between it's, the, it's this user and these leases, whereas a shopping cart is on the server side, really. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty much the same amount of information. Um, the, the one thing I would note about the shopping cart thing is that if we take the approach that every time a user adds something, the leases are extended, then it, it kind of creates a way for somebody to create an infinite lease on the first thing in the, in the cart. Um, so you'd have to you'd still have to impose probably some timeouts on things of how long they've been in the car. Uh, yeah, so um, just to just a few things on this. Uh, certainly, uh, my recollection from the workshop that we had was um, there was there was certainly a recognition that long term we would need to have some sort of notion of a shopping basket. Uh, but um, for V1, the goal really was for us to have a single booking uh, being made, leased and booked with as, with as few calls as possible. Um, I think long term there is no debate about the fact that we need to go down the route of a shopping basket. Um, I would certainly say that uh, from from our perspective, a shopping basket is is a much more natural fit to what we have on the back end. Uh, and further to the point that Lee has just raised about the leases within there, uh, the leases that we maintain are still specific to the line item within the basket. Um, we have a a pre basket commit check to make sure that the leases are still valid um, once a payment has been added to the basket uh, to a try to regain a lease if it has expired uh, and if it can't regain a lease then it won't do the basket commit at that stage uh, you then need to do some other stuff uh, i.e pick another another facility or do something with the payment um, but going back to the point which I was going to make was um, I personally think that for the for version one of this we should be focusing on it as a single booking that we're going to be making um, and I think that we should make that as simple as possible so I would say that it should be a lease and then a book operation uh, the the actual implementation behind the scenes could well be create a shopping basket add an item into the shopping basket with the lease and then the book operation pays for that basket um i i i just think we need to be mindful of the of the actual booking workshop outcome which was we need to keep v1 as simple as possible so you yeah, absolutely agree raymond I I think I think that is I think we're all agreed on the, the simplicity of this, and I think whatever we decide here, the, the there'll be two calls in both cases in V1. Just it's just what they're named and how they're what the. Sorry, was it, I interrupted someone there? Um, just a quick thought which occurred to me. Um, it might be that the broker holds um, a shopping basket containing items from two different providers. It's mm. interesting. Well, that's we we have a we have a shopping basket that that you can do a single payment and it'll split the payment across the providers within shopping basket so it, it, that's something that works across our shop the shop um function on makes that um but that thought makes me think that actually the broker is therefore going to have to run its own version of a shopping basket anyway um, well, uh, uh, so this is um, um, maybe maybe last couple of points on this because I'm mindful of the time. But um, the um, that the, that's that's definitely the um, Spogo one of the Spogo requirements. I think we talked about this in the Legend Workshop was to um, have a, a, the option to book across different providers. I don't think in reality that was something that ever kind of it came to pass because the idea that someone would book a yoga class in this gym and then go to have a you know, I don't know to do something else in another gym, a squash court in another gym around the corner, and want to transact all in one basket for that. Um, was um, that, I mean, Spogo spent a lot of engineering effort on figuring out how to do that with one card payment and splitting the costs. Um, I don't know whether, I don't know how much of an edge case that is basically, but, um, but it's definitely good to bring that up um, for sure, because it's, it's worth considering. Yeah, I yeah, feel like we'll keep get that down somewhere. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's certainly not a priority from our perspective. Uh, and and from our perspective, we have a similar set of functionality whereby we can have a single basket that will span uh, multiple sites and or multiple source applications. Uh, but it is definitely a edge case. Uh, and I would say that that is much, much further down the road. Mm -hmm. So can I suggest we either continue this in the comments on the doc or uh, on the mailing list? Um, we have, because um, we're kind of running out of time. Um, yeah. I, I think there might actually be a halfway house between these two options as well, depending on how we shape the API, but um, perhaps I'll just send an email to the list to discuss it. Yeah, I agree with that, Lee. That sounds, that sounds really good. And I know where we are. We are at the end now of our, um, our time box, aren't we? So I'm just going to quickly highlight where, where the other issues were uh, so that you guys can feed in comments uh, if, you're, if you feel. Um, so um, the, we've obviously talked about this, very useful talk about that there's a question about the anonymous leases um, which is basically should we be able to lease anything at all if we've got any um, personal details associated with, with that um, and that's something that would be interested to hear your thoughts on whether that's a use case you would even think about supporting or do you need do you need personal details because obviously it's open to abuse you'll see that's that's the issue three on the doc that's going to be shared around um, and then uh, we've already talked about this zero offer thing we've concluded that so that's great um, and then finally, uh, the persistent order versus um, reservation. There's there's a bit of a, a kind of uh, bike shedding conversation happening uh, up here uh, in issue one. But I, I think that might be shaped somewhat by the outcome of the last conversation we had anyway. So um, please do yet send your get your thoughts into a comments on this doc or um, or send them around the mailing list as, as Lee suggested. Um, and we can we can pick it up in the next call if there's any any more. I think I think the, the just to conclude the um, this is, we're going to look to get a 0.2 or 0.3 if it changes substantially by the end of the day, so that the guys can start to implement based on this. Um, as you can see from the uh, the very um, basic order here, it's just a simple post at the moment. You post in an order item, uh, customer detail, and the broker name, and that creates the, that that is the lease. Um, and as you can see, the order item could be an array, which allows for a shopping basket. But it, as it is a one call at the moment, um, it, it, it's quite straightforward. So um, at least this version would be something that, that can be implemented now. And then as, as we want to expand on it, whether we create an array of items for the shopping basket and, and, and you know, start to post in additional items or, or however we want to do it, we can, we can expand on that in the different, various different directions. Um, and uh, and that, that's that's really all it does. A book is a patch, um, a patch to add the invoice um, to that. Um, and again, you can you can have a look at that. But that's again using all scheme.org semantics. Nothing, nothing particularly special in that list. Um, it's all um, it's all straight from schema. So uh, again, any comments? Uh, we'll I'll make sure that the the, the version that we release today um, has mandates a patch in order to confirm the booking for a free a free session, um, as, as was brought up earlier. I think that's one of the changes we'll make. Um, anything else on, on this before we move on? Okay. Whilst you're sharing your screen, Nick, do you want to just, just jump to the last slide? Just wants to quickly just go through um, uh, next, just move on to the next one, just the next calls. Um, so obviously the work on this document, this documentation is going to happen ongoing. Um, but in terms of what, uh, what I was proposing that we discuss in the next, next check-in. Um, so on the 28th of Feb, um, I thought we could have more, um, uh, more of a detailed discussion around um, uh, making opportunity data bookable. So some stuff in the draft spec around what's the minimum required but I think that is just largely about hooking into the workflow. I think there might be some other um, requirements that we want to start placing on publishers to ensure that opportunity data is, is properly described well enough to engage users. Um, and alongside that, I want to have a, a discussion around um, kind of validation um, mm. to help kind of uh, tighten up the, the data that's been published. Uh, and then following that, um, as I said at the start of the call, I think we'll have a, some useful feedback from early implementation. So we can use that as a, as a kind of useful checkpoint on some of this early experimentation, make sure that we're going in the right direction and 
see where we're at with the spec at that point. Um, so that was it. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can wrap up now. So as I'll, I'll send around the slides, it's got links to all the documentation in it. Um, as always, if um, be good to get uh, more people attending these calls, please share what we're doing. Um, and I'll uh, speak to you all in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Okay. Any other feedback, just let us know. All right, see you. Thank you. Cheers. Actually, uh, I just have one question uh, just before we go. So the, the other discussion points that we didn't uh, quite manage to get to today, uh, where mm. would be the best place to, to discuss them? Oh, the Google Doc. It just just put the put the comments in the Google Doc. That's probably the best thing. Yeah, yeah. I guess there, there's always going to be a relevant place for each of those points. Uh, there are three issues that are there, are there that we talked about are all all in the doc. Uh, each of them is a, an issue, um, specifically an issue area. Oh, in the uh, color. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if if you exactly that. So if you look in the color box, um, you can uh, you can just add to that either. Well, so. Here, so either add to the um, see here, either either add to the pros and cons list. This is just a, yep. just a wiki style thing, um, or just kind of highlight here and press comment on it, and then just add a comment to either side. Um, and it's quite good actually because you, it, has, it gives time for reflection as well, so it, it's that's kind of a quicker back and forth. Although this was a really useful discussion today, um, but yeah, if anyone's got any thoughts, then please do. Uh, yeah, make th these issues are to be um, added, added to. And when we've got some conclusion on them, then we'll delete the issue out and, um, and, and document it somewhere so we know what's happened. Yeah. And if there are some particularly thorny issues where it would be helpful to have another call, then we can do that. Um, if, if having this kind of solution is the best way to thrash it out. Um, but let, let's, let's work within the doc, begin with, and then see how, see how far we get. Okay. Right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll speak to you again soon. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.